Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Eisenberg, and I am Falvey Memorial Library's Programming and Outreach Graduate Assistant. On behalf of Joe Lucia, Library Director, and the entire staff of Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture with Dr. Shari Bowen, Transcending Trauma on Female Communication in Holocaust Survivor Families. Valley is proud to host an extensive lineup of programming each semester. Today's lecture concludes our fall 2011 lecture series, but we will host the fourth and final installment of the New York Times first year video conference next Thursday, December 8th, downstairs in viewing room three. Gail Collins, New York Times op-ed columnist, will be leading a discussion titled Civil Engagement in an Uncivil Time. She will discuss ways and means for social, cultural, and political survival. Valley's events will be back in the spring, and on January 31st, we will welcome Jamie Ford, author of this year's Villanova One Book, Hotel on the Corner, Bitter and Sweet, for a book signing and discussion as part of his visit to campus and day-long campus-wide series of events. Information on these and all other events can be found on our website, library.villanova.edu. Today, we, wel we welcome Dr. Sherry Bowen, Professor of Communication and Gender and Women's Studies here at Villanova. She teaches courses including communication research, gender and communication, and team building and leadership. Her talk today is part of the Conscience of the Holocaust lecture series, an annual event held by the library to commemorate the anniversary of Simone Wiesenthal's death and to recognize his achievements and legacy in relation to the Holocaust. This year, Dr. Bowen will be discussing the communication of survivor mothers with their daughters using interview data from the Transcending Trauma Project of which she has been a part. Dr. Bowen has been part of this project research team since 1998. Please welcome Dr. Sherry Bowen. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, I'll come around here so you actually can see me, and uh, if you can hear me, that would be great. I do wanna take a moment also, um, not only to thank uh, Falvey Library, uh, for inviting me here, but also the Gender and Women's Studies program and the Jewish Religion and Culture Lecture Series that comes out of the Office of Mi Mission and Mis Ministry and also the Department of Communication. Um, I really appreciate everyone's support. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit today. A number of you, a number of you are, are familiar to me, known to me in different kinds of circles as students, as colleagues, as friends. Um, and uh, a number of you may be interested in the Holocaust in general. Uh, and what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about the Transcending Trauma Project. Um, this project's been going on for over 20 years, actually. I haven't been part of it from the start. And it, it took about 20 years to put together a book, which is actually for sale in the back, um, which I appreciate the bookstore uh, bringing those books. I have a chapter in there. Um, I'm not on the, on the hardback cover of the book, but I was an integral part of this collaborative research team for the past uh, 15 or 16 years. Um, and it's been really pretty amazing um, to be a part of this group that has trying to understand coping and adaptation after the Holocaust. Okay. Um, shameless plug for the book. Uh, let me just give you, an, unfortunately, I wasn't quite prepared for the, for the setup. Um, I don't like reading from the screen, but I'll try to move around and um, we'll try to get through this. What I thought I would do is talk a little bit about the project and talk about some ways that communication as a discipline can help us understand what's going on in the, uh, this Holocaust project. So I wanted to share to start a couple of thoughts from people who study the Holocaust, or no, who were survivors of the Holocaust actually, um, that gets us into that communication feel. So this is one survivor. Uh, she says, I always felt I didn't want to tell my children more than what they could comprehend at their age. They knew very early about the Holocaust because they would ask questions. What I remember, here's another child of survivors. What I remember in my home is a weight. There was always something hovering over the house. They were never more than a conversation away from recalling something in the Holocaust, ever. And it was that way my whole life. Now I make the place sound like it was a funeral home. It wasn't at all, not in the least. But there wasn't a holiday, there wasn't an occasion where a memory wasn't stirred about something that took place there. There wasn't a holiday where there wasn't a yard site or a memorial candle lit. Because for some reason or another, there were always roundups of Jews or pogroms or something that coincided with a particular holiday. And until I got married, I never realized that holidays were supposed to be happier times than they were in my house. 
And I'm making it sound like it was very morbid. It wasn't at all, hardly, but it was just very, it, it was unusual. It was always there. It was always there. Here's a third survivor, a uh, third family, who says, I f sort of felt that we wanted our life to move on and we wanted our children to have a very normal life and not have to pay the price emotionally for what we'd gone through. So my main goal was to provide them with a normal upbringing. So what we can see from these quotes, um, and, and here's a fourth one, sorry, um, from someone who says that they really didn't even want to talk about it because the daughter made all the difference, right? The daughter was born, I had someone to live for. The rest did not matter. And what we see reflected in these quotes is a variety of ways that people can deal with the trauma that they endured in the Holocaust. Some survivors chose to talk about it with their families in more or less uh, ways, um, and some didn't really talk about it at all. And we'll go back to this theme in, in a little while. Um, what, um, what I want to point out first is that there are lots of different ways to study the Holocaust, as you, I'm sure, are aware. Uh, we have a lot of media representations of, um, of the Holocaust, uh, and how we should remember it. There are people who study the historical, um, factual occurrences of different experiences. There are uh, many studies of mem that are memoirs and of literature of Holocaust narratives that we might explore in a variety of different ways. There's a whole host of literature in education, um, looking at what can we learn, what are the lessons that we can learn from the Holocaust uh, to um, generate and promote tolerance and understanding. There's certainly we can look at other social science uh, studies, social, uh, sociology or psychology. What are the mechanisms, what are the groups by which the Holocaust could actually occur? And I want to suggest that in the Transcending Trauma Project, we took a, a totally different stance. Now I want to point out that for, for one, many of the people involved in the program are clinicians. They're social workers and psychologists. And uh, there are two of us who are from communication, a colleague of, of mine um, who was at the University of Pennsylvania, now at Penn State Abington, uh, Hannah Klieger. And she and I take a slightly different approach, but yet a very valuable approach to what we want to analyze in the interviews that we conducted and analyzed uh, uh, with Holocaust survivors and their family members. So I want to it, try to explore a little bit about what we learned from that perspective, but first let me talk a bit about the project, okay? So the Transcending Trauma Project, or TTP in short, deals with coping and adaptation in individuals and in families and intergenerational, intergenerationally as well. We're looking at individuals within their own families and then trying to look at what happens in those families to the survivors pre-trauma, trauma, post-trauma, post -trauma, and beyond to the families. What's the impact, okay? And particularly on that coping and adaptation. And I would say, and how they socially construct the meanings of the experiences that they had within their family units. That's really what I was particularly interested in looking at in my own uh, contributions. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the sample. We have 275 survivors and their family members. Altogether, there were about 62 family units, about 50 intergenerational. We have interviews that lasted two to 19 um, members, or the, the family members. The interviews lasted from probably just over an hour to, you know, to 20 hours or something like that. Um, the way, for you research methods folks, um, the way that we approached this was using a semi-structured interview guide, focusing on topics such as this, pre-war information, what were the, because these were clinicians, remember. Um, we were looking at family of origin dynamics, we did, of course, want to know what the war experiences were, but one departure really, as I, as I hinted at before, is not just the historical veracity of what happened, but how do they interpret it? What do they, how do they account for it? What things do they choose to talk about in their war experiences? We look at liberation, immigration, po and certainly post-war life, okay? Um, and what happens is, uh, we go through and we, the interviews are audio taped, the interviews of the survivors are audio taped, the family members are spouses, sometimes survivors, sometimes not, children of survivors, uh, sometimes their sp spouses, sometimes their children, down to the third generation. And the work that's going on now is really looking at the third generation effects, um, particularly, and that's what I hope to do 
uh, after, um, after completing some work that I'm currently doing. Uh, so we have these interviews, pages and pages and pages of interviews. They are analyzed um, in a, by a triad of, of researchers. And the way that we put this together, I think, is very interesting and um, a little unique in terms of, of methodology in that one person is a child of survivors, okay, so we get that approach. One person is not, right, so that we're not necessarily interpreting everything through that lens because there may be things that would be true of families in general um, that uh, a, a child of survivors might say, oh, that's definitely only because it's a COS, that's the abbreviation for that. Um, but the other person can say, maybe not, and one person is a clinician, okay? So we do have that kind of approach of hearing a little bit beyond what people might be saying or what they're not saying um, with that trained clinical ear, okay? And um, the way that it works is that um, the, the analyses are also, I have another slide for that, so I'll, I'll hold off for a second. The triad analyses meetings are audio taped and transcribed, and we go through a protocol of analysis of trying to understand these interviews, okay? And I will talk about that. The synopses are generated from that. So we have reams and reams of pages from the, the interviews, reams and reams of pages with the analysis. Uh, and some of my other work is looking at the analyses meetings, because I think those are fascinating too. How do you make sense of a family unit, right? Um, and then we tried to condense it back down with synopses um, and looking at uh, just sort of isolating things to 15 different themes that come out in the interviews because that allows us to then begin to, to enter this vast database and draw some comparisons among individuals and among families and across a number of different kinds of topics. Okay? The triad, as I said, has three people. One person is the facilitator. Um, who listens to the tapes and no notes the themes and moderates the discussion in the analysis. Now I want to tell you actually when I started doing Holocaust work I can tell you that story um, another time uh, or if you if you ask me about it, it it relates to an epiphany a word that I never knew until I came to Villanova um, but I had an epiphany and felt a calling to do this work um, back in 97 or 98 and um, when I first started doing Holocaust work, I was working with an oral history archive, and I was listening to the tapes and trying to match them with uh, um, transcripts that were going to be sent to the U museum in Washington, uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And um, I kept wondering more about not just, th those were very much, here's what happened, here's the chronology, and it was all focused on the war. And I, was, I found myself saying, who are these people? What happened to them afterwards? How, where are they coming from? when they are telling their stories. And it's, that, it's, it's through those questions that I found the Transcending Trauma Project. Um, but I make that, that point because I became the facilitator. Okay? I wanted, and not just to facilitate, because I like to do that. Um, and as Jeff said, I do teach uh, you know, group communication, but also because I like hearing the voices. Right? I get something very, very different from hearing the voices of the family members, the survivors and their family members, than I do when I'm reading. It's so easy to gloss over things when they're on the page, but when you hear the emotion and you hear uh, people's um, stops and starts in their, in their voices, it's, it's quite stunning. It really is. Um, in any event, uh, get rid of that. Um, we also have a reader. Usually, if we can help, if we can, it will be the original interviewer who might be able to shed some light. What was it like doing these interviews? That person has read the transcript and listened to the interviewee um, if they are the interviewer uh, during the original interview. And the second reader reads the transcript only. Okay, so you have these three people coming together, and as I said, a clinician, a COS, somebody who's not. Um, and those can dovetail, you know, so that we have clinicians who are children of survivors, we have clinicians who are not. Okay. Um, these are just some of the topics that are generated for the synopses, come out of that protocol of analysis due to the, in, you know, the interest of time. I don't want to go through all of the steps. Um, certainly some first impressions, you know, what, what do we get from this? One of the things I often note is um, you can tell from listening to the tapes when someone is telling you a rehearsed story that they've told a million times before or when they're really grappling with something new because of something that the interviewer might have asked. Um, and that's quite stunning too and very interesting from a communication perspective. We go through the demographics of the family of origin. Um, describing the individuals, describing the relationships, 
the dynamics of the family of origin and the dynamics of the nuclear family that the survivor creates. And I should say that when we interview family members, there's a lot of triangulation um, in asking, so you might ask the daughter, what do you know about your mother's experience? You know, um, what was her story during the war? And sometimes you get different stories, which is also quite stunning. Um, so we do have that, synop that uh, triangulation. We ask about pre-war, uh, post-war uh, faith and beliefs about different experiences during the war. And I'll, I'll t uh, tip my hand and tell you that um, uh, the project as a whole, one of the key findings I think that we have, pres that we have offered is that it's pre-war, right? A lot that, that matters, right? That matters a lot, not just war experiences. I think a lot of the literature out there suggests that it's the trauma during the war that has significantly affected people. And what they'll do is they'll punctuate the research starting with the war. Now, I'm not here to say that that didn't have an impact. Of course, war experiences, Holocaust trauma in labor camps, in concentration camps, in getting displaced, in, uh, in hiding, and uh, you know, all kinds of things, living in ghettos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, that had an impact. But I think one of the values of this particular project is by punctuating and looking before. What do people remember? Did they have a, um, a significant attachment figure? Did they have positive relationships in their family or with a caregiver um, early on in their lives? Because that's some of the stuff that can give you strengths um, to have resilience later on in life. We also look at that, so the chronology, of course. We explored themes of self-preservation and coping, as well as dehumanization during the war. We asked uh, survivors, particularly, how did they explain their survival? Because obviously we don't get to talk to the ones who are no longer left. Um, and we do talk about liberation and immigration to the US. Most of our sample was interviewed in the United States, some in Israel. And I think there were some in Canada too, Shauna. <laughs> so North America would be probably more appropriate there. We look at marriage and children. Um, we ask about other kinds of topics that emerged not only because they were important in the interviews, but also because they were of interest to research team members. Um, the losses they endured and how people felt about that. Uh, the notion of food when somebody has been so deprived for years. Does food play a prominent role later in their family lives? Dreams, other health issues. Um, obviously, an, of interest to me was communication about the war to other people. Um, did they do it? How much did they do it? Who did they tell? And of course, in general, post-war coping. Okay? Some more things about impact. Um, about attitudes, and you'll see some examples of that as well as we go along, okay? Now, um, what we did, as I pointed er, to in the diagram earlier, we compared some of these themes across the individuals within families and then across families. So even though I don't want to say that um, the, each individual survivor and their family doesn't have a unique story, of course they do and we want to preserve that, but there's a, there's a way in which you, you need to begin to say, what do we learn if we look at family and family and family and family across a variety of different kinds of experiences? And I will tell you that the um, nature of the war experience is not the primary determinant of how well or how poorly on this continuum of very successful and not successful at all. Um, it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to have an impact. Right? So somebody who was passing as a non-Jew and got through the war or who was shipped to England um, might be doing badly in um, their emotional life or in their family life or in their professional life um, in a similar way as someone who went through horrible concentration camps and went through six and went on death marches might be doing exceedingly well. So there's a tendency to think the extremity of the, of the trauma is going to directly impact and that's not true in our um, in our data, okay? Um, we used uh, computer stuff. This, is, this goes out to, to Chi. I'll give you a shout out for that. We used SPSS <laughs> to code some of the demographics. We also used NVivo, um, which is a, a software program for qualitative research where we got to um, thematize and look for particular themes and words on a whole variety of topics, including some of these uh, tolerance and political beliefs, resilience, um, this notion of mediating parent, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, pivotal narratives, the stories that survivor, children of survivors take with them, faith and explanations for, of, for survival. Okay, little diagram of looking at the, uh, each family member and that triangulation in terms of trying to understand the family dynamics. Okay. Um, 
grab some water, excuse me. Yep, there goes the mic, right? Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things, I believe, uh, out of the project, um, and something that may set it apart from other kinds of work on the Holocaust, is this quality of family dynamics paradigm. Um, we have five constructs, and you can see the last one is the open or closed communication. That's true, that's fine and good, and you'll see it in a moment when I talk about the motives, but it also relates to closeness and distance, uh, and these are perceived as continua, empathy and self-centeredness, validation and criticism, positive emotions and negative emotions. And I'll show you some definitions, and you can read them for yourselves while I take a drink of water. We have, we have, I'll give you the positive ones first and then some of the negatives. Is the child, is the, is the child of survivors in this case um, validated? And also then children of survivors to their children. Um, are there uh, expressions of love and affection, uh, et cetera? Is the communication, when we get to the open or closed, we look particularly at um, open communication in general. Are they an open kind of person and or family, and certainly about the war, we differentiated those. Uh, on the negative side of the continuum, we could be distant, you can see cold, infrequent kind of communication, negative contact, um, self-centeredness um, uh, of, the, of the caregiver, self-absorbed, sometimes damaging to the child's well-being, critical, uh, expressing a lot of resentment, disappointment, anger, dissatisfaction. Um, and some of the impacts of that. And then again, the, the reverse of closed communication. Okay. So one of the things that I did, so that's all background, right? Can you believe it? It's background. So I'll try to fly through telling you a little bit about um, the, the work that I do specifically on communication. The motive study I call is, is really just descriptive, okay? It's just descriptive in the sense that what we did is we looked for in the interviews, times that people, the survivors and their children, talked about, talk about the Holocaust, right? So the survivor might say, uh, yes, I went out and talked to, you know, the men's club and the schools and this and that and the other, or somebody would say, no, I didn't say anything. Similar to what some of the quotes that you saw um, in the beginning, and also to their family members, okay? What we looked at um, for this was the survivor parent and, ch and the child or children uh, we looked it, as a subset, 87 interviews and synopses um, that reflected 31 families uh, uh, from our sample. And um, this was kind of interesting. The, the um, five construct quality of family dynamics template that I showed you earlier emerged from the study. Okay? We didn't go in thinking that that was how we were going to do it. This was very much a grounded uh, kind of theory, um, grounded theory process, of very much in the, in the qualitative um, tradition. But when we went to do some, and, and um, in this study, we were doing it simultaneously with this quality of family dynamics construct being put together. And what we ended up finding, um, which was really great and said, oh, we've got something here, is that p families that were doing on the positive side of that continuum, guess what? They had different kinds of communication in their families than the families who were not doing as well. And it went beyond the open and closed kind of thing, okay? Um, certainly that was part of it, but, cert but not all. So that was very interesting. And I just want to just give you a couple of um, thumbnail sketches of, of what this looks like. We can talk more uh, in a bit. We ended up coming up with, when we looked at those 87 um, interviews, we found that there were basically a set of motives for sharing about the Holocaust and a set of motives that people talked about for be remaining silent. In terms of, of sharing, it was just uh, unfolding the narrative, right? It was very just sort of matter of fact oftentimes. It wasn't emotionally heavy. Um, and you can see sort of even with the labels that we gave it, it gets a little bit more emotionally heavy as we go on. Telling the story too was just this is a lesson you got to learn. That's where we get the never, never again. We must remember, you know, what do you learn about getting an education? What do you learn about um, being able to take care of yourself? Those kinds of things. And yet there were also people who compulsively shared and couldn't seem to turn that off at all. Um, in, the, in the unfolding the narrative, um, sometimes it would be just remembering a previous time. Um, there is one family that um, is in our sample where the survivor 
mother um, told her granddaughters stories, and these granddaughters thought that these relatives were still alive, right? So it was all very positive and wonderful, and um, uh, nur they felt very nurtured by the stories, not burdened by the fact that, guess what, those people didn't survive, okay? So responding to direct questions as the survivor reveals her or himself, this is unfolding the narrative, okay? Um, in lessons to be learned, you might have things like I alluded to teaching the history, um, fulfilling the obligation. We had a, a several people in our sample who got a message um, either verbally or non-verbally, in one case a note, you must tell people what happened to you. Um, and that, that was their connection to a parent, for instance. In why do people tell to get prepared? It could happen again. We don't want this to happen again. Yet we also know that uh, genocides continue to happen even in our lifetime. Um, to instill courage and character development and to nurture gratitude and appreciation for what we have, right? Starving children in Biafra, anybody remember that one? If you're my generation, you might get that. And certainly children of survivors got the, you better be gr grateful for what you have because look at what your, our family members did not have, okay? I starved for nine years, right? Um, and I say that in a cynical, loving way. Uh, and I am not, I should say, a child of survivors. I don't know if I said that, but certainly I've grown up um, my, and spent my whole life hearing these stories. The compulsive, sometimes the person seems to be stuck in time. They're still stuck in that time period and are constantly telling stories because they can't seem to get beyond it. And we also see people at the end of life, um, unfortunately, who feel the need to unload the burden that they've been carrying. They might not have been open about their experiences, but as they age, they really feel um, quite uh, compelled to share their stories. Okay? On the other hand, motives for silence might include um, emotional protection. Uh, you might not, you, I'm sure you won't be surprised. This is obvious, but it's so interesting to see the way that it gets played out. The survivor parents want to protect their children, right? It was, there was a lot of that. I don't think they should know in the one quote, you know, I had, they didn't need to hear what we went through. They needed to enjoy life. This was a new life. This was a new country. Um, but children also protect their parents by not asking the parents what really went on because they don't want to upset the parent, perhaps. Um, so that was probably the biggest one, uh, the biggest motive that we found in, in, this, um, in this particular study of why people did not share information about the Holocaust. Some survivors say they were just simply not asked, right? Some people believe that they, that people could, the other people, the listeners, couldn't hear the stories about the Holocaust, that they would think something negative about the person telling the story, okay? Some people just say, I don't remember. Um, and some people, again, we saw one of the quotes at the beginning, do not want to dwell in the past. They want to move on, okay? Um, as we explore this particular research, and I'm going to just move on, um, we're looking at some of the notion of self versus other directed. Um, we also want to look at some of the temporality, the, the reference to time in the talk, whether they're talking about the past, whether they're invoking the present, whether they're future directed, because I think these things are going to intersect with um, how people communicate about the Holocaust. Um, as I alluded to before, telling one seemed to be most related to the best, the most positive uh, family dynamics that were going on. Um, we ended up being able to classify families into positive, negative, and mixed. Um, you probably won't be surprised that the largest number of families were mixed, right? But we did have a significant number of positive um, in the family dynamics and overall functioning, as well as negative family um, functioning. Um, and also, even as a communication scholar, I can say not all talk is good. We had this conversation yesterday, right, about the more, to more talk isn't always better. Um, so we do have to, to consider that. It needs to be adapted. It needs to be appropriate, okay? Um, I, um, in terms of the, the family dynamics, um, there was something I wanted to say in there. We'll see if it comes up. I don't know. Uh, in another study, shifting gears a little bit, we'll see if we, we get to it. Um, it had to do with um, uh, the quality of the family dynamics, going back to that, but I don't know. This talk was called uh, Female Communication, right? And I want to tell you that when I started doing this work, I, was, I went in in 1997 or 98 with my gender hat on, right, and said, I think there are gender differences. I really want to find out, is there a difference in the ways that women and men talk about the Holocaust? Are there different ways of coping? What's going on with that? 
And so far, I haven't really found that. Okay, there are some gender differences in some of the things that come out, but a lot of it has to do with um, the time and place of the people's experience. That it was maybe typical of, you know, let's say European life, and there was certainly some, you know, gender sex divisions and differences in terms of roles. Um, but some of the things that I thought I was going to find, I, I did not find. Uh, I know what it was I was going to say. This whole project comes out of. Um, the whole Transcending Trauma Project comes from a perspective, even though we have the negative families and the positive families, the early research about Holocaust survivors suggested that it was all negative, that if you went through that trauma, you were by, me, by just had to be damaged goods and really messed up, and therefore you were going to mess up your kids, right? It, that was the assumption. Um, and this, the Transcending Trauma Project said, you know, a number of children of survivors, particularly, and cl the clinicians said, you know, that's not true. You know, here we've got people, my family, this family, that family, the other family, seem to be doing quite well, these survivors. And so it really turned, and now we've seen this in the field, that now there's much more of an emphasis on, re on resilience, right? And so this project really was part of that shift to looking at what allows us to be resilient, right? Particularly in the face of, of trauma. Okay. Now, if we turn our attention to parenting, um, in this particular project with Samantha, I want to credit Samantha Gable, uh, who uh, got her master's from the communication department um, in 2011. Um, we worked together on this project where we were looking at a subset of the families and looking at mothers and daughters, particularly around mothering and around parenting. Right? She was very interested in gender, in the social construction of motherhood, um, and so we together looked at this particular um, uh, subset of the data, which I'm hoping that I uh, can continue with and maybe get back to some of those gender questions that I started out with back in the, in the 90s. Okay? Um, in this pr little pilot study, we looked at nine mother-daughter pairs. By this point, since she was doing it in the last, couple, last year, we already had the families coded into that positive, negative, and mixed. Okay, um, and so we decided to, to deliberately choose families that seemed to be doing well, the positive, families that had some mixed ways of interacting and um, mixed success in terms of how people were functioning, and also um, two from the negative. Okay, and we particularly focused on three things. So here's another example of what can you get when you look at um, communication. Uh, about the Holocaust or with, in Holocaust families, okay? And in this particular one, and I think because of time, I'm not going to have a chance to give you lots of quotes, but I'm, I have many, many, many of them, and I really apologize for not um, getting to a lot of them. Uh, but we looked at modeling maternal behavior. You know, how did mothers, again, you can imagine, sometimes they would say, um, they didn't have a mother, the survivor mothers, parenting their children in this country, right? They would say, I didn't have anybody to, to respond to. Or they might say things like, um, my mother had two maids. What did I know? You know, we didn't know how to do anything. We were very well off, and I didn't, I didn't really know anything. Um, and how does that transmit it to the daughter? We also focused on social support and, and also some of the maternal practices that uh, you might see between mothers and daughters. What we were especially looking at here, and there's a lengthy review of literature, is the social construction of motherhood and how it's been studied. The notion that mothering is not natural, <laughs> necessarily, that, that, mo that we don't get a manual on how to be a mother either, right? That parenting is a negotiation um, that's related to a lot of different aspects of one's life, okay? Um, the models of mother motherhood that the survivor mothers and therefore their daughters uh, bring to parenting um, are very much contextualized with where they were in their location, their historical, social, cultural uh, context um, and milieu, sometimes as things were remembered, right? And sometimes things are very deliberately chosen, sometimes things are done unconsciously, right? And we see examples of that in the data. Um, the maternal practices that we might be looking at are playing with the child, telling stories, what are the stories that are chosen to tell, where do they come up, um, just what happens when you're cooking with, uh, uh, particularly this in a mother and daughter, although certainly that those aren't the only people that cook together, um, but they would talk about that because you get family stories when you're cooking together, right? Don't you tell stories when you're cooking with somebody else? I do. 
Um, the, they can be about a lot, of, a lot of things we were particularly interested in, the ones about parenting, and certainly displays of affection. When we look at the, the social support issues, we were interested in how did these mothers, survivor mothers, talk about the social support that they either went out and sought, came to them, or that they lacked as they were going through their own parenting of, of children without extended family. Because of course that's the big difference, right? You know, I, I look in Drexel Hill close to where we live and where we are here, where there are many extended families that still live together. Survivor families didn't have that, right? If there was a sibling, it was sometimes rare. But quite often there were sole survivors of families that are then thrown into a new milieu, let's say the United States, and said, okay, have children because you want to perpetuate, you want to, you know, have a partner and, and, uh, and have children and make babies. Um, but what do you do with that? It's not a natural thing, okay? So we were looking at that social support um, fa uh, effort. Um, we have lots of questions that remain with this. Um, I don't know. I really thought I would get to the quotes. I'm so sorry. Um, but some of them are, how do, how, does, how do these maternal practices, this notion of motherhood, of parenting, how does it contribute, and our understanding in general from what I presented, um, contribute to coping and resilience and adaptation in other situations and circumstances? Certainly, there is the uniqueness of the Nazi Holocaust, but there are things that we can learn for people who are enduring trauma now. What goes on with what I've just talked about with other kinds of beliefs and attitude, right? What, how do the notions of parenting and of mothering intersect and interact as we negotiate other aspects of our, of our um, relational lives? Um, there are many, many, many possibilities, and I hope that we can have some question and answer and some discussion afterwards where you can tell me, what should we do with this huge data set that we didn't already do in the book? I thank you for your patience, and I look forward to some conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the project, I believe, um, I want to say it's from 1933 on, anybody whose life was disrupted from 33 on because of, of Nazism. So it's a, broader, um, it's a broader definition than some, but it could be anybody who was forced to emigrate early. Um, what becomes interesting about that is there are people, even in our database, who don't define themselves as Holocaust survivors. Right? They don't take on that definition, but they are survivors by virtue of our sort of broader definition. But again, it's like Einstein. And, I mean, there's a whole influx of people who saw things coming and were able, to, you know, they were usually people with some means and they got out early. Mm -hmm. but they Mm -hmm. Anybody at 33 and after, mm -hmm. right? So if it was before 33, not so much, but um, from 33 on. And we do have, and you, you might see if you look at the table of contents in the book, we do have people from all ages. One of the colleagues one of, um, was really looking at adolescents and how they might differ, adolescent ch or child survivors might differ from the adult survivor, right? right? And, and how they... Uh, how they coped and adapted afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good question, though. Others? Yeah. I have a question about So, in general, do you have a sense about whether silence is Do you any good at all, or do you sense that trauma is better than silence? Mm. My sense is that some kind of talking is better than total silence, right? Um, because what you get, um, there was the quote that I had up there really, uh, it, um, actually the chapter title uh, for, for my chapter on motives is the elephant in the room, right? So for families that don't talk, the Holocaust is the elephant in the room, right? And people, you often will hear kids say, the children of survivors, I really wanted to know, but they didn't talk about it, and I was afraid to ask them. And then that person ages and dies, and, they, and we don't know, right? We really don't know what did that person endure, what was their experience. So my sense is that um, the, the, the talking, the communication has to be appropriate, 
however we want to define that, but it's probably better than total silence. Yeah, yeah. Did you find anything about whether it's positive or negative um, uniformly across the board about guilt that did survive? <coughs> I think, well, one thing is that the whole notion of guilt is, is very problematic. We've spent hours and hours and hours talking about this survivor guilt. And um, I think that there's a publication waiting to be written about that too. Because I think people mean very, very different things by survivor guilt and how that guilt gets played out, but it's definitely there. And I would say, that, of course, I can't say this absolutely and systematically, sci social scientifically, but my gut, re my gut answer would be it's across the board. Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, of course, you could be obnoxious and say it's Jewish guilt, you know, Catholic. I mean, it's all guilt, right? Um, but what is what do we mean by that? It remains to be really, really unpacked. What's the guilt about? How's it expressed? Right? Is it the guilt that the survivor survived and their family members didn't? Is it the guilt that they chose to do some things or they felt maybe in the parenting um, example, maybe they felt incapable of doing things, right? What I didn't get into were, were um, you know, we do have that continuum of how well and how poorly people are doing. Um, many people, uh, some of the studies that look at that sort of, um, uh, you know, the psychopathological kind of version, the damaged good version, w they were looking at people who were hospitalized or being treated for depression. Well, wait, aren't they going to be more negative? Yeah, we were looking at people who were not hospitalized, although I can say some of our people have been through therapy, not all. And that, again, crosses the board. It's interesting. You Wouldn't it also depend on what their experience was? Because if, if one of the women were been taken in with medical, all these horrible things medically done, whereas another survivor has been in a workhouse kind of thing, and not a very, I mean, wouldn't that make it whether they want to divulge these things and to their children or not? Well, it's from a communication perspective, and, and also from the findings in the, in, the, in the study overall, in the team, um, that didn't have as much of an impact uh, about that, because there are ways, even if you endured something, you might not diver divulge that to a 10-year-old, right? But you might talk about other kinds of stories, or you might teach different kinds of lessons about tolerance or understanding of other people, right? But that's what I meant by saying that the, the particular experiences were not um, the factor that determined how well or poorly people did, right? And from a, from a social construction perspective, it would be how does the person interpret what happened to them? So for instance, the man who doesn't define himself as a survivor, but yet his whole family was uprooted and you know, fled halfway around the, the world before they settled down, he doesn't define himself as a survivor. We'd look at that and say, oh my gosh, look at all of that, right? We're, and somebody else who went through a death march um, would say, but we just survived. You know, we just did what we had to do day by day by day by day. So you would like to think that it's that easy. It's not that easy to, to, to cut across and explain that. But it's a good question for sure. Uh, yeah, question. Genocide. Yes, I will point, there's a chapter in the book, um, my colleague Nancy Isserman um, uh, looked at tolerance and intolerance, and again, you would think people who have been through this would be absolutely intolerant, not true. It's just not true. Um, and there are people who are quite tolerant and say we have to understand where they were coming from or we need to be understanding and tolerant to make sure that we don't end up in those kinds of polarized kinds of situations. We do have people who are intolerant, very bigoted, very um, prejudiced, but not, that's certainly not everybody. And the key, one, one thing that's really interesting, guess what it was tied to, not surprising, that quality of family dynamics in the beginning, pre-war, right? What did they grow up with? 
What kinds of stories did they hear growing up? What kinds of attitudes were in the home? So it makes me feel very, um, I don't know, that, 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 you know, if we go full circle to the parenting, parenting is a pretty awesome job to think, what are we telling our kids, right? And it doesn't have to be the, the didactic, do you know that this happened in Rwanda? Do you know that this happened in Germany or Poland or whatever? It, it also is about how do you treat other people, right? As you would certainly agree. <laughs> Good question, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if any of, if you asked this or if anyone volunteered, how participating in the study, how mm. being interviewed impacted their understanding or changed their interpretation or not? Or, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, we did have people who would comment on that. And you can hear it when you listen to the tapes. You can hear people pause and say, you know, I haven't really thought about that. You know, and also, you know, the 20 hours of tapes, that's not in one sitting. I mean, it's over successive periods of time. So sometimes you go as far as the person can handle, right? And they might think about something and then come back to it in an interview. Um, but definitely there was an impact. There were things that people had never been asked. Um, we had situations where people told stories that had never been told before to their own family members, to their spouses. Um, so that was really fascinating. We also have ex an example, I can think of one man, especially in the, in the group that was very, um, he had his story and he was sticking to it. And he was in that box and he wasn't going out of it, right? He wasn't willing to really go through some of that um, reflective um, processing, right? But so there was a range there too. Another thing, one of the other projects that I worked on with the other communication person, ironically, um, is looking at the communication in the triads, how we did the sense making of the families. And with that, um, that was jumping off of um, an interest in what's the impact of studying this stuff, right? If you listen to all of these stories over and over and over and over again, how do you deal with that? It's a lot to hold, right? I found myself actually when I was reading the transcripts, um, that I would miss parts. And when I went back to them, guess what? They were really horrific experiences. And I know that that was a psychological coping mechanism, right? But then when you start talking about those things, you would say, well, you know, I think about my own kid, or I think about my own mother, or what about this person or that person? So there's a, there's a, a way in which there's that other la layer of learning about oneself by doing the work, right? So I answered more than you asked, but yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. I, Do, I think of Ellie Wiesel telling that she thought one of the things that gave him hope in, in the concentration camp was if only the free world knew about mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. that they would do something about mm -hmm. it. And he said one of the moments of greatest despair in his life was when they had him liberated and he went to the library in Paris. And he found that he read through the newspaper. So it's, I mean, you can right. see right. that being a possibility. Yeah. Where do you go from there? Right. Right. Well, I think I spoke to that a little bit in the tolerance and intolerance. Um, the other thing that there's also a chapter in the book that people looked at faith and have looked at explanations for survival. Did they survive because of a god? Did they survive because they were um, smart? Did they just survive because they, you know, how do they attribute it internally or externally, you know? Um, so I think there's a, a variety of ways that people will, will look at that. But certainly, you know, what's the meaning that you attach to the experiences and your treatment? There are some people that are very, um, resentful of how they were treated after liberation when they came to this country and people didn't want to hear about what they had gone through right so then they they do begin to shut down and be silent right yeah yeah definitely you said that you studied uh, people living in Baraka and Israel 
Was there any difference between? You know, it, there were a few that were living in Israel, so I'm not going to, I can't really speak to that. Um, what's his name? Uh, Daniel, is it Bar Own? Has done a lot of work with the survivor population in Israel that, that is, um, in some ways, it's kind of consistent to what we've been doing here. A few of the survivors or family members were in Israel, and I, I think that um, before I came on the team, they were doing some interviews. Uh, they did some interviews at a survivor gathering in Israel. But m the majority, the vast majority, were living in North America, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, what do you mean by tolerance? How can I be tolerant uh, to the when you mark people as being tolerant, what does it actually mean? Tolerant, tolerant to other groups and people that are not your own, right? So, so somebody could say, um, I was Polish and this happened to my family, but I don't hold it against all Polish, Polish people and certainly not Polish people now. In a way, yeah. How do you treat people that are in groups different from your own? You know, do you become, I mean, the, the assumption would be that you would be closed and only want your own group, people like you. And that's not what we find in, among these um, survivors and survivor families. There are some, but not all, at all. But by far, not all, right? And so it's kind of interesting to look at that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, obviously, like, they were in this situation because of their religion. How did that, how did that play out? And then did, were they like, did they blame it almost? Or did religion help them? Do you know what I mean? Again, you get a range, right? You re definitely do. Um, there's one woman, one of the chapters, I, because it became, it was really over the years of these analyses, you'd have these quotes that would become metaphors for our discussions. And some of those quotes ended up as chapter titles, right? And then as we knew we were going to do a book, eventually they, they, we were like, oh gosh, we need a chapter. That's a chapter title. Um, but one of them is called A Minion of Trees. And a minion is a group, a group of 10 uh, Jewish adults to, that you need 10 to say certain kinds of prayers in a, in a particular service. And if you don't have 10, you're not supposed to say those prayers in public. Right? And so this one survivor said that she didn't have family, but she counted trees. And she marked herself when she was in the woods, 10 trees, and then she would say her prayers. Like, is that, you know, it's a beautiful image. There are other people who say, I totally know more. I don't believe in God. You know, if this God could let this happen, then my faith is gone. So again, you, you had quite, quite a range. Um, there are people whose, strength, uh, whose faith was strengthened. There were um, definitely people whose faith was changed and whose practice we also in the, in the study looked at not just belief but practice um, and how that changed pre and post. <laughs> some, some, certainly not all, but some, yeah, yeah. Uh, not in this particular study. I want to say that they were all Jewish. I'm pretty sure they were all Jewish for this particular study. Some of the spouses are not Jewish. Some of the children's spouses are not Jewish. Um, but I'm pretty sure they were all Jewish. Or born of Jewish mothers. <laughs> No. Maybe another study, right? Definitely. You know, I mean, I think it's worth, it's worth looking at. Um, but we started with the, the mothers and the daughters. Probably because most of the team members happen to be female. Not all. We do have some men on the team, and some men who did some interviews, but, um, and certainly men who were interviewed. Um, but I, maybe that's the next book. Yeah, I think people did address that in those tolerance questions, the people and uh, groups, you know, question. Um, I don't think there was a gender, uh, you know, a consistent difference based on, on, on the sex of the, of, the, of the interviewee. I think it crossed. You had men and women both ways. Yeah. But certainly, you know, that would have been one of the questions I would go into, you know, would, would, we, would, would have gone into the project thinking there might be some gender differences in that. Would you expect more intolerance from men? No, not necessarily.
Well, I thank you all for coming. Please enjoy the refreshments supplied by the communication department. And I'll be happy to talk more and buy some books, too. <laughs>